How you doing? Uh, you're very welcome to Traz and Atira. I'm Marcus Howard of East Horizon Stories, and I'm going to be interviewing two brilliant historians and authors about their new book, Someone Has to Die for This, Derek Molyneux and Darren Kelly. These historians have written definitively on the 1916 East Horizon and now the War of Independence. And if I'm ever asked to recommend books about this period, I'd always recommend theirs. They write warts and all and are not afraid of where the facts fall. They deliver history as it should be without any cuddly answers. It's raw, it's intense, it's violent, it's courageous, it's unflinching in its intensity. They've also collaborated with me on a number of documentaries, including Michael Collins, The Final Hour and Bale and the Blah, Bloody Sunday, 1920, The 1916 Battles of Main Street and North King Street, as well as films on Dan Breen and Sean Tracy. I've had a sneak peek at this book and it is up there with the best of them on the War of Independence. And I just wanted to show you just quickly um, their books because I wanted to mention just a little bit about them before we actually start, okay. So these are the four books that they have. And I have to say the first book, When the Clock Struck in 1916, looks at in incredible detail the battles that took place around Dublin. Uh, not just the leaders, but the men on the ground doing the close combat fighting step by step. And you really felt like you were a part of it when you were in there. Their second book, Those of Us Who Must Die, takes you through the immediate aftermath of 1916, including the grisly manner of the executions and how the men who took part in the fighting were treated upon surrender. Again, you feel that you're there with the men in prison wondering if you're going to face execution or not, such as the writing style. Their third book, Killing That is Very Extreme, takes the reader from October 1917 to November 1920. It looks in depth at the intelligence war. It looks at the raids, the assassinations, the hunger strikes, the prison escapes, the ruthless executions by what would become known as the squad. The fourth book, their new book, Someone Has to Die for This by Mercier Press, looks at the final months of the War of Independence. This book, it actually starts with Bloody Sunday and it doesn't let up from there. It's that intense. It really accelerates. You actually feel like you're walking alongside some of the IRA assassination units of the period and how they fought auxiliaries, police and military in Dublin. It's possibly the most intense book I've read of theirs and that's saying something and it is one of their best. Um, so Derek Molyneux, you're very, very welcome. And Darren Kelly, you're very, very welcome tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Okay, well, before we go on, folks, um, I'd just like to say a few words for the occasion that's in it. Um, Darren and I would very much like to thank all of you for attending this evening. And of course, we'd like to thank the one and only Marcus Howard for presenting this in his own unique way. I think we'll all agree on what a tonic Marcus is and has been over the past six or seven years to everyone who has striven to make the decade of centenaries so justifiably memorable. So keep up the great work, Marcus. We'd also like to thank Trasna and Atira, an organisation who have really stepped into the breach over the past 16 months to keep Irish history alive and vibrant, and we could not think of a better venue, therefore, to launch this book this evening. Regarding the book, as most of you will know by this stage, this is our fourth book in what has morphed from an initial and fairly spur-of-the-moment plan to write a single book about 1916 that started eight years ago into what is now planned as a series of five books in total dealing with Ireland's revolutionary period. Now, this would never have happened without your support. Put it simply, it is the fascinating and a huge array of people whom we've had the good fortune to meet and work with from Dublin, from Ireland, Britain, all over the world that has inspired us and led us to this latest point. We, we cannot thank you enough for this. It has been an incredible journey so far, a real roller coaster, but it has been fulfilling in the extreme to have walked in the shoes of our forebearers in such a level of detail as required to complete these works and to look at how modern Ireland was forged from the convulsions of the period about which we write. So thank you all. Thanks also to both of our families for putting up with us throughout all this. I've known Darren for 35 years at this stage, would reckon that we'd be called hard work at the best of times never mind when we're immersed in this sort of stuff um, for immersed truly is what we've had to come to put this incredible saga together so thanks guys to all of you for your for your support and for not having us whacked or up for driving you all to distraction time again. <laughs> regarding the book itself We'll be exploring it in great detail very soon with some very interesting questions that Marcus will no doubt unleash. So I'll keep this short and say that readers are in for some serious surprises with the book. I can tell you all how detailed and how unflinching it is, but most of you will already know that from reading our previous works. But I'll say only this, brace yourself. 
this gets really bumpy. Now, I'd like to say a few quick words about your press while I'm here. Mercier Press have been incredibly supportive of this project. Like all businesses over the past 16 months, they've been on the receiving end of a tidal wave of unforeseen challenges, the like of which no business can anticipate. Nonetheless, their enthusiasm for our work has been a real tonic. Mary's energy is simply infectious and the company's reputation as a stalwart of Irish historical publishing is truly well-deserved. Mary has encouraged us and shown a deep passion for our subject matter. And to say that she, Deirdre and everyone else there has gone way above and beyond the call of duty would be an understatement. So thank you, Mary, and all at Mercy or Press and everyone associated with the company for your support and encouragement. And long may we continue to enjoy our work and relationship. OK, so folks, I think I'll park the speech on that note. And thanks again, everyone. I hope you all enjoy what's coming next and, of course, the book itself. Okay, thanks very much, Derek. Um, I just wanted to ask you guys, uh, this book is looking at um, November 1920 to July 1921. So why split the books into two parts when I have a big book? Well, with the book, there's just, if you like, if you put those two books together, um, like Killing That's Very Extreme and uh, Has to Die for This, the, there's just so much information in it. And to be honest, when we got to sort of about, well, I know it was definitely where I was, when I got to about Kevin Barry's uh, execution, I was starting to really sort of feel it. And it was sort of, you realised how much further there was to go. Like, even though it's a, sh or a shorter amount of time as such, but you would just, you would just end up shell-shocked if you didn't split it. If you read that all in one, you, you'd, I don't know if you could handle reading it all in one. I think it'd be a bit too much. When um, it was Mercier as well who sort of said, I tell you what, we'll, we'll finish here and then start another book as well. You know, we, 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 we have to decide that as well. It was just like, a, like, oh, yeah, I think that's an absolutely brilliant idea because what you've got in, in the uh, uh, Killing That's Very Extreme is you start to build up your characters. You start to know them all. You get to really know them. And then when you go into sort of the uh, this, the new book, Someone Has to Die, you start getting newer characters in as well that are mixing in with these people. So it, it would have been a lot to take in. I think it was, it was a really good decision to split it, give the readers a break, and then throw them straight back in again uh, at it. And it does, like Derek said there a minute ago, it just starts and it doesn't stop. Oh, no, sorry, Marcus, you said that, didn't you? It, it, it just starts and carries on and keeps going and keeps going, like, and it gets rougher and rougher as you go through it. So I think personally, it was a really good idea. And I think it would be good around and written it to be able to stop and just, you know, take that break, digest what you've just read, and then carry on. I'd say, I mean, I'd, I'd agree. It's that, I mean, it was pretty much because of the sheer level of detail it required, Marcus. There were so many intertwined stories from so many participants. And I mean, at the end of the day, we could not have done the story the justice that we felt it deserves with a single volume. But bear in mind that this, this, is, this is the first time that the, the full story of the War of Independence has been told from start to finish with all the interwoven elements presented as a chronological narrative. So, I mean, it was a huge undertaking, but having now completed it, we we can see why it was never done before because it was a colossal task, but I mean, a huge rewarding one. But to emphasize, I can't name a single other book that deals with the war in this way. There are loads that deal very effectively with particular aspects, some truly excellent ones authored by some of our viewers here tonight, I might add. Others have been written to include the full spectrum of the war's various <laughs> facts. They deal with each one uniquely or separately. Now, we, on the other hand, we don't. We tell the story from the ground up, from the streets to tenements, to the fashionable houses of the well-heeled and from the corridors of power, not just in Dublin, but throughout Ireland and Britain, from the perspective of the civilians and the combatant and non-combatant belligerents from both sides, dealing with the fighting, the assassinations and reprisals, the politics and the propaganda, like I said, from start to finish. And it's an astonishing story, but simply put, far too big for a symbol, for single volume, in our opinions. And again, we're very grateful to Mercier Press for a you know, agreeing with us in this regard and for taking the project on. Okay, and is there something in particular that you think 
would make the book stand out for a reader? Like what makes it stand out? Well, one thing would be the start to finish aspect that I just referred to, but really what makes this and their other works truly unique, Marcus, is the way they're written from their, from the streets perspective, so to speak. We capture the vicious and the brutal nature of warfare with graphic descriptions of fighting, assassinations, executions, be they by hanging, by firing squad or more field type executions. Then there's the skirmishes, the reprisals and the atrocities. But this is set against particularly in our two War of Independence books, scenes from the cabinet rooms in Westminster or from the public gallery in the House of Commons or from the stately British military headquarters in Dublin. So in a nutshell, it's the presentation. We like to make readers feel like they're actually witnessing the events for themselves, be they from the cobblestone city streets or the snugs and rundown pubs where Republican strategies were rolled out and shuttle diplomacy went into overdrive, from back rooms where assassinations were plotted and, like I said, from the more affluent venues that also facilitated both sides and their intermediaries. And happily, feedback today on our works indicates that we've very much succeeded. Okay, okay. Um, a lot has been written about what's known as the squad, but they're also called the active service unit. Could you tell us more about who the active service unit are? Right. The, um, the active service unit, they were put together basically um, by the Dublin Brigade. Oscar Trainer sort of um, took up, the, had taken up the role and he pushed it forward for the active service unit. So the active service unit, you could, you could, sort of saying it was a bit like a, a city flying column. A bit, just a bit like that, you know. They were on the active service, as his name says, all the time. So they were very similar to the squad. They were sort of paid. Um, they were divided into four sections, one, two, three, four. And each, so where you have the first battalion, you would have a, a section from there, second battalion, and they would correspond to their, to those numbers. Their job, they, uh, their weapons were handguns and grenades. So now we're talking, you're getting up close, and they, their job is to attack the auxiliaries wherever they could come across them. So they would gather up information. No, like let's say there was an auxiliary are going to turn down a certain road in Dublin at a certain time every day. So they would lay an ambush for them waiting. And then it would be hand grenades and guns, get through as much damage as possible. Um, so but literally they were, to, they were put together to take the fight to the British on the streets of Dublin. I mean, I'll allude to some of the things that Darren said and expand a bit more on that. As, as Darren said, it was, it was 50 strong. It was formed on St. Stephen's Day in 1920, and their formation was originally Dick McGee's idea. Captain Paddy Flanagan was the, of the 3rd Battalion. He was the first um, officer commanding of the active service unit. It comprised of four sections. You had two for each side of the city who would be deployed according, as Darren said, to their battalion's operational areas. Uh, two lieutenants reported to Captain Flanagan, one of whom was Frank Flood, who was later hanged in Mount Joy. The ranks were filled with elite volunteers. There were two drawn um, on average from each battalion company. Their initial headquarters was in 17 Eustace Street, which is today in Temple Bar, but they later moved to Strand Street, just across the river. Um, members were paid a salary of £4.10 per week to leave whatever jobs they had and become full-time members. Now, this was the same rate of pay that the squad members were paid. Huge casualties, Marcus, were correctly anticipated among the unit, but there was a quid pro quo that, that for this that they would be offered the first places in whatever army was formed once victory was secured. So when they later morphed with the squad into the Dublin Guard, this did indeed become the first National Army unit under the provisional government formed in January 1922. So it could therefore be argued that the active service unit was really the nucleus of what is today the Irish Defence Forces. Formed, they took the fight relentlessly to the enemy. They patrolled the streets carrying revolvers with an average of about 12 rounds per man and, as Darren said, hand grenades. Now, they continuously harassed the auxiliaries, causing huge disturbances in the city. Later on, they became more involved in squad-type killings as well. Active service unit attacks featured in the book took place on Bachelor's Walk, Parliament Street, Mount Street, Eden Quay, Beresford Place, Fibsborough, the Long Mile Road, what is today Parnell Street, Calester, Ballyfermot, Aaron Key, Crumlin, Thomas Street and the Christchurch area to name but a few. Their principal modus operandi was to strike and then disappear and to ensure not to get drawn into prolonged engagements that would favour enemy superiority in men and weaponry. 
They developed following a bit of a shaky start, owing pretty much to unreliable hand grenades into an elite fighting force that was utterly ruthless and inflicted damage upon the enemy that was vastly disproportionate to their numbers. Their input into the custom house attack was pivotal. They took part in both the burning itself as well as providing effective covering parties. Now, it's important to state, and it's also detailed in the book, that despite losing a great many men during the custom house operation, the, the unit soon to become a guard under Paddy Daly, Joe Leonard and Parag O'Connor, all utterly ruthless men, it was back up to full strength within a week. And the Dublin Guard rapidly ensured that lightning attacks that had become the active service unit's hallmark increased both in frequency and in ferocity in the weeks leading to the truce. They finished strong. Now, it must also be borne in mind that the other city battalions, including the recently formed 6th Battalion, which operated in the south of Dublin, also radically upped the ante during spring and summer 1921, and a great many of their attacks, which broadly mirrored those of the active service unit at that stage as things progressed, are also detailed vividly in the book. Okay. Um, something that I remember us mentioning before, and it leads into the next question, uh, was, you know, we, we kind of dismissed the rumor of the Cairo gang and that actually there was an Igo gang and a Eugene Igo. Uh, could you tell us about the influence of Eugene Igo? Who was he? Was he the threat he's generally made out to be? Well, the, the Igo gang, as they were known, yeah. But they, what they actually were was they were, their official title is the Identification Squad. Now, Eugene Igo was, he was a male man, but he'd been in Galway and during the rise and was a battle at Caramore Cross. He was involved there. He's seen uh, one of his comrades in the RIC being killed. And I think he sort of, he got his anti sort of Republican. He was already a bit a sort of anti-Republican, but I think he really got, became staunch at that point over that. So I obviously I'm not too sure he might, he might have been close to the guy that was killed. So, but anyway, uh, Winter, Armand Winter, but he realised Dublin is full of volunteers from the, the country and nobody knows who these people are because they're, they're, they could be on the run from the country. So they come up to Dublin and they disappear. So he, he decided to put the identification squad together. So he trawled through all the records and basically he came up with a, a few. He narrowed it down and eventually chose Eugene Igo to run it. Um, it varies now in how many men. Some say there was only 12 of them, but there was definitely more because um, it, I believe they were split into two squads. Yeah, because you, these, you couldn't have 12 men patrolling the whole of Dublin all the time because you can see that with the squad. They even started to say, we're getting burned out here. You know, we, when they were just coming up to about 12, we're getting burned out here if we're out all day long looking. We can't be out all day and all night. So there has to be more than two squad, two squads of this unit. Um, they very cleverly realised how they were going to basically take on. They studied the squads, the newspaper cuttings from the squads, hits and other hits throughout Dublin and all, and attacks, and took on the same sort of um, modus operandi, let's say. So they split in pairs. And what they would do was they would come, they would spot someone. They used to go up to the, the railway stations and spot people coming off the trains into Dublin. So they would surround them, literally surround them, and veer them off and then arrest them. Now, they, they got the blame on quite a lot of killings. But there's never really any evidence to link I go to any killings whatsoever. There's only one sort of shooting um, like an intentional shooting that you can sort of uh, link him to, him, which was Sweeney Newell. Well, that could have been because uh, he got the impression that Newell was brought up to identify him, so he would have realised they're after me now. So he, it, it sounds like he was giving them a warning, don't send anyone after me. So um, they were quite a big threat because if, let's say, you have a squad of men in Dublin and uh, the auxiliaries and everything know who they are, these men are virtually useless for sending it. But country people coming up from the country can easily blend in and not be noticed. So their job was to basically capture uh, volunteers coming up from the country. 
And it would have changed into sort of, they would be given like probably pictures of, let's say, name off the top of my head. Um, uh, let's say Charlie Dalton. Even I know they already pulled him and they let him go. But like, then they would be on the hunt for them as well because they were proud, proud in the city. And there was, um, who was it that was picked up by them? Um, Todd Andrews was picked up by them. And he recognised your man Killian, who was out, who was an RIC man from uh, Dunleary, I think it was. And he, he describes how it is, and it's all in the pairs, suddenly swooped up, brought to the castle, and it's brought to the guardhouse, and then they're gone. And there's just auxiliary standing in front of them. They've basically disappeared. So what? So you get the impression they bring them there, they hand them over, and they're gone. But as a threat, definite, a definite threat. As um, sort of the the myth that's built up around them, like that he he was like going around killing people. I think is wrong because um, one one member of the squad. Um, not squad, sorry, you must, yeah, sorry, the identification squad actually wrote to a newspaper and gave his address saying, no, we, we never got involved in any of this. Clark, I think was his name. Igo came back to Ireland in 23, I think it was, and got married in Galway. If he was such a big threat, if, you know, they would have, like, if he was such a, if he was, if he'd been going around killing loads of people, he would have been hit at this. There, there would have been people looking for him. So obviously, I think it's just a myth built up. Just, <laughs> yeah, just expanding there on, on what you said there, Darren. I mean, I, I agree. They were definitely... Okay. <laughs> I mean, we, we refer to one particular instance in the book where the squad and GHQ intelligence were both pursuing the unit at one time and were nearly enveloped by a military patrol in the process. But Igo was ruthless. I mean, the fact that he shot Thomas Sweeney Newell, as Darren mentioned there, um, in the middle of a Dublin street in broad daylight, this was a clear indication that he feared neither the IRA nor their publicity machine. Um, Igo's interrogation methods were featured, or they, well, they were feared, and the, the Dublin Castle uh, knocking shot, as it became referred to, where Igo and others regularly beat the crap out of IRA suspects, became notorious. The unit's tactics were fairly efficient. Um, yeah, they patrolled in plain clothes, in tactical formations, alternating routes, whether they were on foot or by tram or by car. They certainly weren't infallible. Um, we could give one example on the 3rd of March 1921 when several cars containing Igo's gang members drove straight into a well-prepared ambush by the active service unit on Aaron Key, driving on the precise same route where a patrol from Dublin Castle had been similar <coughs> just days earlier. Now, we have a hor horrific instance depicted in the book which took place in February 1921 when three plainclothes policemen who were not actually assigned to political duties were inadvertently mistaken for Igo's men. All three were shot dead by the squad in the most brutal fashion in Parliament Street, one falling through a plate glass window as he was being shot. But um, ultimately, they weren't really a game changer. I, I swear, look, as the IRA were simply too well organised, they were too ruthless and they were just too bloody efficient. But a testament to their effectiveness nonetheless was, I suppose you could say it's Igo's promotion from constable to head constable in such a short period of time. Okay. Um, like, would you need to read your previous book to read this, or could you read them as a standalone book? Oh, I mean, you have to read them all, you know. I mean, so you better all go out and buy them all, please. Come on. <laughs> it is yeah, yes and no. Look, there's there's more context about the characters and obviously the earlier part of the war itself and killing at its very extreme. I mean, both books, as said, they encompass the entire story of the war after all. But I mean, nonetheless, this book could definitely be read on its own and its overall narrative would still be gripping and useful to even a complete novice to the subject matter. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I, yeah I'll just add. Go on. Go on ahead. I was just going to add there. <laughs> Who's going? You're going. Shall I talk? <laughs> Go for it. Yeah, I was just going to say the same, virtually the same as what Derek said. But yeah, I think yeah, if you read the second one before the first one, I don't think you 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 you, you will sort of miss how you got to July twenty one. Because it's quite a big build up. It's like it's like a steamroller just going and going and then keep going, like all that snowball falling down a hill. You you need to sort of 
you could read them individually, like the second one and then the first one. But I think if you start off with um, Killing at Third Stream and then the snowball just starts rolling down the hill, by the time you get to July, you'll, yes, I get it. So, yeah, but like there it says, you do need to read every single book we write. <laughs> or else. <laughs> Twice yeah. as well. And no, and no lend on the mouse. And, and, and Darren, Darren, don't forget, yeah, you have to read them at their very extreme. <laughs> Yeah, the yeah. Only thing though yeah. That is that if you're interested in this time period, like 20 to 21, I don't see why you, you can't start with this. Like everyone knows Bloody Sunday. It's a great like figurehead point to, to start off from. You don't have to read it in order if you, if you don't want to. Like, um, no. no, you don't. You don't. Um, could you tell us about the negotiations that were going on? How did they progress? Uh, what changed between November, December 1920 and July 1921? Ooh, okay. Well, this will be a good one. Um, okay. Carl Ackerman is a remarkably interesting and often over player whose input into what developed into the negotiation process that went with the ending of the war and the subsequent treaty negotiations is someone who springs to mind here. And we refer to Ackerman about this and the previous book. Ackerman interviewed Michael Collins as a journalist for the Philadelphia Ledger in August 1920. During the interview, Collins portrayed a very hardline stance. Now, Ackerman was aware, however, that Collins and Harry Boland had given his colleague, George Creel, an interview the previous year. Creel had then formed the opinion that Collins and Boland and their fellow revolutionaries would happily settle for Dominion rule rather than the Republic if push came to shove. Ackerman, however, was also reporting that Basil Thompson of Scotland Yard, whom he admired very much, and he provided a profile of Collins to Basil Thompson that was used later on in, in 1921 when it came to the treaty negotiations. But I've often wondered if Ackerman and Scotland Yard had purposely played up Collins' reputation in the USA that August when dozens of articles appeared in American newspapers which were quoting Ackerman who heralded Collins as Ireland's real commander-in-chief. Now, this certainly contributed to the divisions that were already flaring up between Collins and Cattle Brewer in Dublin. Brewer, after all, was Minister for Defence, not Collins, and Richard Mulcahy was IRA Chief of Staff, and I would hazard a guess that De Valera was not particularly enamoured with Collins being named as commander-in-chief either given that he saw himself as the president and might have felt his position to have been somewhat demeaned by what Ackerman had written. But I'll, I'll come back to Ackerman. Patrick Moylet was a senior IRB figure and he had been negotiating with the British Foreign Office in autumn 1920. Now, tentative progress was made with the British at one stage accidentally acknowledging the validity of the doll in a letter to Arthur Griffith as a sort of written Freudian slip. But following Bloody Sunday, Moylet, well... He assumed that all bets, all bets would now be off, but surprisingly, this turned out not to be the case. Lloyd George still wanted to negotiate at this point, but it was around this time that the Irish shot themselves in the foot. When Archbishop Clune was asked by Lloyd George to mediate with Sinn Féin and Patrick Moylet found himself suddenly marginalised, prominent Irish church leaders, including Father Michael O'Flanagan, who was vice president of Sinn Féin, and Sinn Féin TD, Roger Sweetman, as well as members of Galway, county and city councils, but they berated the tactics being used by the IRA. They did this publicly, and this was perceived as a, a sign of weakness by Westminster, of discord in the enemy camp. So Michael Collins and Arthur Griffith, needless to say, were furious and had to try and reel these people in. But sensing weakness, well, this was when Lloyd George, advised by Field Marshal Sir Henry Wilson, among others, insisted that the IRA surrendered its weapons prior to any negotiations. Now, this was never going to happen. So by Christmas 1920, negotiations had stalled. All bets were off. However, when De Valera returned from the USA at Christmas, he was immediately looked upon as someone who was not, as far as the British were concerned, tainted by blood in the same way they felt Collins was. The conclusion was that De Valera was indeed palatable in terms of being brought to the table. So this was when the backroom peace feelers started to get sent out once again. Then, as spring 1921 progressed, Winston Churchill was reshuffled from the war office at the same time as four prominent diehard unionists stepped aside, those being Edward Carson, Philip Kerr, 
Walter Long and Tory party leader Andrew Boner Law. Boner Law stepped down temporarily and these men were replaced with more moderate individuals helping to further pave the way towards peace talks. Also, the previous year had seen a more moderate chief secretary and two, two undersecretaries appointed in Dublin Castle. One of those, Andy Cope, who after the sacking of Balbriggan the previous September had referred to British rule in Ireland as a great spoof. Now, he was a realist and he began feverishly laying the groundwork in Dublin for talks. Then Lloyd George became increasingly more amenable to talks once Ulster was put out of the way, as far as he was concerned, with the Government of Ireland Act coming into force. Also, another noteworthy player who appeared around now was a strong supporter of De Valera's and an associate, associate of Carl Ackerman's. Now, his name was Martin Glynn. Glynn met Lloyd George and convinced him to strongly consider meeting De Valera, emphasising the positive effect that this would have in the USA in propaganda terms. Now, this was pivotal. This brings us back to Ackerman. Now, he met Collins again in April 1921. Collins then provided Ackerman with a written interview which betrayed a similarly unyielding stance as that previously portrayed in August. Now, this wasn't really taken seriously by senior British officials, but nevertheless, it might be perceived as a sign of the chasm that was growing wider by the day between Collins and de Valera, who was, as he later put it, trying to unshackle Ireland from the straight jacket of the Republic, while Collins, on the other hand, appeared to be tightening the straps on the same jacket, and worse, Collins appeared to be doing this unilaterally. Now, this seemingly disjointed approach actually continued into the summer as negotiations loomed ever, loomed ever closer. The negotiations helped on in no small part by De Valera meeting Lord Derby, who was acting on Lloyd George's behalf, and also meeting James Craig, who represented Northern Unionists. Now, after the Custom House was burnt, Austin Chamberlain, standing in as Tory party leader, he suggested that, that they would really have to talk to Sinn Féin at this point, and the, the British military high command indicated that they had two choices in Ireland at this stage. Either go all out, once and for all, against the IRA, or get out. The high command were sick of this so-called police action in Ireland, and they indicated that if talks could not be held well, then they needed to go simply full tilt, something that the politicians feared would make Britain look like it was launching another Cromwell-like conquest of Ireland. So this sentiment built into what ultimately led to the truce being hammered out. De Valera had been straining to make peace. Collins, however, right up to the truce, well, he was sending out directives dismissing any such talk. Now, this could also be seen as well-crafted, good cop, bad cop strategy, but I often wonder if it was not also a case of Collins's notorious penchant for going off on solo runs, a characteristic that regularly brought him into conflict with others. But ultimately, Marcus, it was a combination of the British realising, particularly after the Custom House, that they simply could not subdue the IRA in a manner that would be palatable to their own people and to the wider world, particularly the USA. And the intervention of several prominent unionists, including Andrew Jemison of the famous whiskey brand and the South African Prime Minister Jan Smuts, as well as numerous others that helped out the truce, not to mention Andy Cope, of course, who took huge personal risks in Dublin, acting as a go-between for Dublin Castle when he took part in further secret talks with Patrick Moylet, who was brought back into the scene um, as a peacemaker by the early summer. So well, that's what changed between December 1920 and July 1921. Well, simply put, and they realised that, that they admitted it, Marcus, that they were, the British were unable to beat the IRA. And realising this, they had no choice but to meet and negotiate. Okay. One thing that... You guys are pretty good at is busted open misconceptions. And um, what common misconceptions about this period did you try to address? Okay, well, this will be a good one. <laughs> Over to you. <laughs> we didn't so much try to address any misconceptions. Um, it's more like we just illuminated them as we went along with the work. But one such illumination was that largely British intelligence was far more effective than they are generally given credit for. One example of this was seen just last November when Ireland approached the centenary of Bloody Sunday, when prominent commentators were saying that Michael Collins' squad wiped out British intelligence on that day. Now, British intelligence wasn't wiped out, and I think Darren will probably talk more about this afterwards, but it was certainly wounded and shook up, but it very quickly recovered. 
Bloody Sunday is an area where we lay bare some further glaring misconceptions in the book. Now, firstly, it wasn't Michael Collins' squad. Dublin Brigade, which the squad were answerable to, carried out the hits that day, assisted by the squad. And every hit, once initially proposed by IRA intelligence, had to be approved by Cattle Brewer and the Army Council. And Collins was not the mastermind behind the operation. It was organised tactically by, among others, Dick McKee and Sean Russell. Collins was indeed a member of the IRA Army Council, and of course, as Director of Intelligence, he was centrally involved. But the attribution of the operation's tactical success towards Collins above all others, it's, it's wholly unjustified given the sacrifices and the efforts of so many participants. But I suppose, I mean, while we're on the subject of, of Michael Collins, I mean, he's generally perceived as the romantic type of Scarlet Pimpernel, you know, laughing as he sidesteps the British from his bicycle as he single-handedly led the revolution. But this is clearly not the case. And it's this is not pointed out now to detract from Collins's greatness, not for one second, but it's ridiculous and overly simplistic to suggest that Collins was some sort of infallible superhero. He wasn't. He was an exceptionally brave, talented, and lucky individual. Well, I mean, lucky up to a point, but he could also be as careless as anyone else. And there were consequences of this to numerous others. And ultimately, you could say himself. But he had an obsession with holding on to paperwork, which when discovered on enemy raids, it placed many of those close to Collins, particularly Ned Broy, at huge risk. Now, Richard Mulcahy was also guilty of leaving a trail behind for British intelligence who discovered huge volumes of paperwork while they saw him out. But Mulcahy, in fairness, is not so much adorned with the laurels of historical sainthood as Collins is. Another misconception that we illustrate, as do others, was Collins' detrimental influence on the Custom House operation. Now, viewers of Neil Jordan's Michael Collins movie would argue that Collins dismissed the Custom House as a foolhardy enterprise similar to the blind sacrifice of 1916 and that Devon was idiotic in insisting that the, the job went ahead. This is not the case. Collins approved of the operation, but then he tampered with its tactical planning to the exasperation of those charged with planning and directing it. He insisted that a ring of cordons throughout the city that were to be deployed to prevent the enemy from approaching the custom house during the operation, as proposed by its planners, would be incorrectly perceived as a general insurrection and insisted that there was to be no such cover deployed throughout the city. Now, this ultimately facilitated the speedy arrival of the auxiliaries that day, leading to so many casualties and arrests. Now, this brings us back again to De Valera and another misconception. Now, we're not apologists for De Valera, but one ridiculous comment that's often bandied about is that De Valera hit out the war in the States. This is not the case. I mean, the worst fighting by far took place in the seven months after his return. If you want proof, just it's all in here. Some other misconceptions would include the laying bare of the perception that British would have steamrolled into Ireland had the IRA and Sinn Féin not agreed to sit down and, and parley with them. The book vividly details the apprehension felt by senior British commanders at what it would have taken to fully suppress the rebellion. And this was before they got to the additional complications of keeping Ireland in check afterwards. They were terrified of the prospect of continued war and its human and financial costs, and particularly how this would be perceived in the wider world. You want another misconception? Okay, how about the fact that unionism in Southern Ireland was a lot stronger than it's generally given credit for? There's numerous examples in the book that illustrate this. And here's another one, that the war was won by flying columns. It wasn't. Flying columns were instrumental, but what ultimately won the war, you could argue, was propaganda. In this, the IRA and Sinn Féin were truly world leaders. The British simply could not get a look in. And these are the people so often overlooked. You've Kathleen McKenna, Desmond Fitzgerald, Erskine Childers, Frank Gallagher, and Robert Brennan, who completely outmaneuvered the British step by step throughout the war. They succeeded in portraying an image of Britain's horrific reprisals in Ireland to the world in a manner that was indigestible to the influential readers of international broadsheets. And this was what really forced the British hand in the end. I'll give you one or two more misconceptions. One that the Irishmen were queuing up in their droves to take the fight to the British. Well, in many ways they were, but it must also be remembered that the Dáil had to issue a directive to prevent Ireland's young men from emigrating during the latter and the most ferocious part of the war, yet thousands still tried to flout this 
and a great many succeeded. Here's a final misconception. A dairy man I know recently suggested that one of the things he found very interesting about this and our last book was that they laid bare the myth of the good old IRA versus the bad new IRA associated with Northern Ireland's troubles. He referred to the tactics of daylight assassinations in full view of civilians, of grenade attacks in busy city streets or remote controlled explosives. What you'll see in this new book are references to germ warfare, of the use of chemical warfare, of people being what would be referred to today as disappeared, as well as scores, if not hundreds of broad daylight killings with attendant civilian casualties and deaths. You'll see submachine guns being used on trains and also being brought to, to be used in built up streets. You'll see businesses being threatened, of levies being raised to fund the IRA and a, a host of other tactics employed, such as attacks on mainland Britain and the targeting of politicians that were also used during Northern Ireland's more recent troubles. What also fascinated us was how the sentiment of not sitting down with terrorists was also bandied about by British politicians when they secretly sent out backroom envoys in their droves to make contact in 1921, similar again to later on in Northern Ireland. Okay. Um, that's really interesting what you said about, like, I mean, the Northern Troubles compared to the War of Independence then and how, I suppose, be some similarities that maybe... <coughs> They were deliberately not seeing as they got older, uh, those people, you know, that took part. Um, how did the intelligence war progress in 1921? Uh, right, the intelligence war in 21, really, you need to get sort of a bit of a background on that. So, um, as we know, uh, the IRA basically decimated uh, G Division. So, as a functioning unit of, of police intelligence, let's say, it's out the window. So the British then were sort of are relying on, hang on, sorry, <clears throat> the Dublin District Special Branch, which is like the military intelligence. And a lot of these are part-timers. So they come in that, uh, or they may have given up and then they come back and yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll get involved with this. So at this stage, the Irish intelligence, uh, the, uh, the yeah, sorry, the Irish intelligence are in a quite good position. They have people in the castle feeding them information, like Lily Minnan. They've got like police officers in there. So they're getting good city information coming out of the castle. So they've infiltrated it. Um, so this, so they start to get the names of um, all these Dublin District Special Branch, the military intelligence officers. So that's who we see getting hit on. Um, uh, in November and Bloody Sunday, yeah? So, but what they don't realise is Basil Thompson at this point has already started to feed in his deep undercover operatives. They're already, they're coming in, they've got specific jobs. They, they will not be, they report directly to Basil Thompson. No one in the castle will know who they are. There's about 60 of them in total. And um, their job is to infiltrate the IRA, basically. Um, will probably never know in our lifetime their names. Um, so Bloody Sunday happens. So they wiped out, the, basically took a, hit it a blow. It's a bit like, the best way to look at it is, um, do you remember the Dante Wilder and Tyson Fury fight? I love a good metaphor, you know me. And Dante Wilder smacks Tyson Fury one and he goes down like a sack of bricks. And you look at Dante Wilder's face as he turns around, he thinks, of one and looks back. And he's getting back, Tyson Fury is getting back up off the That's exactly what happened after Bloody Sunday. What the Irish intelligence does not know is there's tougher agents coming. They've been training them in Hounslow. They would have been transferred over to the 10th Royal Fusiliers, I think it is. And they're being trained, and it's the spy school. And then they're being sent into Ireland. They arrive after Bloody Sunday, probably, let's say, within a couple of weeks. Their first job, what did they do? They clear out all civilian personnel from military intelligence. So one thread is dried up. So then, as we know, as it goes on, and you'll see it in the book, slowly they start to uncover everyone else in the castle. So it comes to the point, I think it's around about March, I think is the last 
sort of assassination from the squad. And that would be with that sort of intelligence. So that's dried up, that's over. You'll see the squad sort of drop out. They become sort of, they disappear off the map for a while. There is no more sort of hits. So the intelligence is still, the Irish intelligence is still working. The British intelligence is getting stronger and stronger. And remember, we've still got these 60 undercover that nobody knows about. They're the type that will be sitting in cells beside four or five Irish IRA men. Yeah, like the next thing would be signing up. And you know, oh no, we were in the cell, he was picked up. So, and then they would have a specific job. So they're still doing their job. Um, so then what you find then is towards the end of, especially after the custom house, Whereas in the first place, uh, GHQ intelligence, like Irish intelligence, is out on its own and he has ex the squad men seconded to them to do their hits. What happens then is GHQ intelligence is seconded to the Dublin Guard. They're, they're seconded back to the Dublin Brigade. So they now work for the Dublin Brigade. And um, Joe Leonard and uh, Padraig O'Connor had to go in to them every day in the mornings to their offices and read the piles of what they built. They've now turned their intelligence work to ambush. So that sort of information can easily be picked up by someone standing on the street. And you also see it in um, the, attack where the planned attack on Grafton Street. Um, William Stapleton says he was walking down Grafton Street and he can see all the intelligence officers and he goes, they all look like dandies and, and students hanging around. He got, and he thinks, yeah, that's great for some, isn't it? What, what are they doing here? Well, what they're doing is now out there, their intelligence coming from the castle is gone. So now they have to actually go and sort of stake these places out, integrate themselves with people, get to exactly the same way as Basil Thompson's men is doing at the other end. So it, it does, it has its ups and downs, but you can see the, uh, the GHQ intelligence is not, it's not finished once the squad hits drive, it just uh, morphs into something else. So, right, okay, that's gone. We need to readjust, we've got all this. We need to start pulling in all the pop files on who can be ambushed, like uh, British army trucks, who can be uh, auxiliaries, how many times do they come up and down Parnell Street or whatever? How many times are they on Bachelor's Walk? Is it the same time every day? So it, it it morphs and it keeps going. It never goes away. Whereas British intelligence once sort of um, sort of after Bloody Sunday, you can start to lose track of names. The names become harder to find, whereas before, you know, you, you can find them, there, but you just don't know what their jobs. It becomes very, very more secretive than what it was before. They tightened it up. They tightened the whole thing up and they made, basically made it impregnable. Okay. I'd agree. I mean, what, picking up on what Darren said, I mean, it, it could be said that the British had the IRA on the back foot in terms of intelligence, contrary to, you know, popular belief, and particularly at a GHQ level, where, you know, where Michael Collins was central. I mean, the IRA suffered a, an initial setback, a serious setback on, on New Year's Eve when Eileen McGrain's office on Dawson Street, which was used regularly by Collins, this was raided and a load of paperwork was discovered that ultimately led to Ned Broy's arrest. Now, this in turn led to Jim McNamara, who was another pivotal IRA mole, having to also leave his Dublin Castle employment and go on the run. Now, this then partially blinded Collins as intelligence director. David Nelligan stepped in to infiltrate the British Secret Service at that point, but not to any game-changing extent. Now, it's, it's noteworthy, that, as Darren said, that after Bloody Sunday, the British removed any civilian workers from their military intelligence. And this this did, re really did help to tighten things up at their, their end. Um, Ormond Winter, the, the notorious uh, James Bond caricature type individual, or a, a bad James Bond bad guy, you know, individual in an overall charge of British intelligence, you know, with the monocle and the cigarette dangling from his lips. Well, he ran a relatively well oiled machine despite problems with internal politics. But these really began to encroach. And we list a couple of examples of IRA members who were turned, as Darren, you know, suggests there by Winter following their arrest. And interestingly, as Darren said as well, that the squad's last successful assassination took place at the end of March 1921. This was more than three months before the end of the fighting. Now, this is notwithstanding their involvement in the attempted rescue of Sean McGowan and the Custom House attack, both of which are detailed vividly in the book. But from April onwards, 
it, it was really the ASU and Dublin Brigade's intelligence, which worked more remotely from GHQ and from Collins, that, that the way I see it, that they took the fight to the British, and this they, they, they certainly did. Um, Winter's Central Raid Bureau, this was in full swing by April 1921, um, another of Michael Collins' offices, one on, on Mescal Road, was raided and a vast number of papers seized again on the 1st of April. He then lost two Mary Street offices in early summer. So Collins was really on the back foot by this point. Huge arms and ammunition seizures went hand in hand with this in Dublin, um, leading to what approached a critical supply situation for Dublin Brigade. But they, they persevered nonetheless. But there's also the high level intelligence stuff where the British were displaying like incredible acumen in the intelligence field. I mentioned um, Carl Ackerman's input earlier, presenting as a journalist, which of course he was, but also secretly reporting to Scotland Yard. And as I suggested, this interaction is explored in the latest book in terms of fostering discord among the Irish camp by very astutely playing ego against ego and very successfully. But this sort of personality profiling was also central to the British strategy of determining who they might someday negotiate with. Interestingly, they had been closely monitoring De Valera in New York, and the agent charged with this at the time soon followed De Valera home to Ireland. Then, of course, it was British military intelligence at a strategic level that ultimately helped sway the British government towards negotiation. Their intelligence services effectively estimated the cost of subduing the IRA and their subsequent assessment, which in many ways overestimated enemy capability, a testament to the IRA's stunning ability to fool them, but this paved the way to the truce. So overall, at a central level, IRA intelligence was struggling. Its effectiveness tapered down towards the end of the war owing to enemy penetration, while at more peripheral levels, the slack was being taken up, by, taken up more effectively by individual brigades and companies who by summer of 1921 were matching the tactics fostered initially by the squad in Dublin with equal ruthlessness. Okay. Um, I, I've got just before questions and then we'll throw it open to the audience. Um, what do you feel you have achieved in writing the four books? Will you be writing more or is that it now? Uh, fundamentally, Marcus, I think, we've, I think we've managed to provide a long overdue window into what went on between 1916 and 1921 from a perspective that was glaringly absent. This was to take this incredible story encompassing all layers and to present it in a narrative that's accurate, but also user-friendly and accessible to all readers. I mean, we've presented the, star, the, the saga so far in an unbiased, unflinching, and as you yourself said, Marcus, warts and all format. I like to think we've, and feedback today suggests that we actually have successfully introduced a new generation of readers into this seismic story. There are, these are readers who might not be the typical types to go looking for less dramatically written works that detail the people and events in a way more suited to, for example, university students or intellectual societies or people like ourselves with a pre-existing interest in the period. But I think we've also written them in a manner that is greatly appreciated by these latter types of people as well, which is great. But really, we've managed to encapsulate the accuracy boasted of by the most celebrated works on the period and combine this with a writing style that people have professed to finding irresistible. And this is as it should be. It is, after all, an irresistible story from whatever viewpoint you have. I mean, what went on in Dublin and Ireland between 1916 and 1921, it shook the British Empire to its very foundations. And this was accomplished by an army of citizen soldiers, male and female, ordinary people with largely very limited means, whom many of us here are proud to call our ancestors. And I know you too, Darren, as well. And ordinary people who fought this fight, and it was them who saw this through against so much. Yes, the leaders are obviously pivotal to events, but there are volumes upon volumes written about them. We wanted to tell the entire story, but to focus more on the the broader spectrum of characters so often ignored. And as I said, I think we've very much succeeded and we're delighted with the feedback that suggests we have. Will we be writing more? Of course, Marcus, sure, it's addictive. <laughs> we're already neck deep in the groundwork for a, for a book on the Civil War. So watch this space, people. We're suckers for punishments. <laughs> <laughs> Could I just add there, um, 
I think Derek nailed the head on there, what he's saying. I've, I've just sort of got it wrote down here, the full story from 16 to 21. But what he forgot to mention was their tears that are in there. From <laughs> It was like, oh, no, what, what is going wrong? Trying to work things out. And I'm sure there was quite a lot of tears. But I was... Um, I'm quite glad there's one book in there and that is those of us who must I know they're their books so I love them all but I was really delighted that we did that because I don't think anyone ever went into it and even though people sort of said oh you know you know that could be a bit of an odd one in the middle we steamed ahead with it and said now it's got to be done like um and it goes through like the executions and the deportation and you get a vivid picture and that was one of the ones where I sort of got to the end and um, at James Connolly's execution after writing the whole thing, going through the whole thing going through and being very unemotional about it and then getting it back in a book and reading James Connolly's execution I actually started crying and that's why I'm saying you, you, Derek forgot to mention their tears there. Yeah. <laughs> and that's no word of lie. That's hand on heart there. I cried tears when I read it. I uh, I, the uh, and as I was going through them and then got to that point. Yeah, no, I think the level of detail you guys do, I think it really, really, you're right to take your time with it because it certainly sets you apart from um, other books. Is, is there anything in this book, though, that really stands out for you? Um, well, well, there's so much that it's, it's hard. Uh, maybe, yeah, yeah. Um, one thing overall that stands out, really stands out, is the resilience on the Irish side. Now, like, this was incredible. And, I mean, not just the resilience. It was the way that the revolution from 1917 to 1921, later referred to as the Four Glorious Years, was conducted with such professionalism and ruthlessness. They, they got the mix perfect. Like the three-legged stool of military operations, political effectiveness, and a stunning propaganda campaign was, was perfectly crafted. Now, of course, nothing is ever perfect. And the, the maxim that no battle plan survives contact with the enemy is used very often for very good reason. But nevertheless, the overall levels of synergy that materialised in such a way to allow this fight to be sustained against such odds is simply amazing. Every single move that was made by the Republican side was met with a counter move by the British. Likewise, every single strategy shift undertaken by the British to regain the initiative was met with stunning creativity and audacity from the Irish Nationalist Forces and their political associates, but the Irish were always a step ahead. And as you progress through this book and its predecessor, you'll, you'll see that it's, it's nothing short of mesmerising what they achieved and how they went about it. And I suppose it's really tragic, therefore, to see what came next. But look, that's for another day. And in any event, very few revolutions are followed by peaceful times in any country. 100 years ago was June... 1921 and uh, a truce comes in in July 21. Could you paint a quick picture of Dublin and Ireland in June, July 1921? You have one of the warmest heat waves in living memory. You have terror stalking the streets of Dublin and many towns and villages throughout the country. You have war fatigue. You have hundreds of the pinprick types of attacks that were so detrimental to the British military taking place daily. Then the British military itself, which was gearing up on a huge scale for more conventional styled operations. You have men and equipment being shipped in en masse as the ground is laid for Crown Colony government. In Dublin, you have continuous attacks. Nowhere and no one is safe. Informers are sought out ruthlessly by the IRA. Military are now operating in their own the British military are now operating in their own flying columns in the city on foot or by bicycle as their transport situation has become dire. There are continuous rumblings of peace sought desperately by a great many, dismissed also by large numbers who favour the continuation of the war. But you also have the IRA gearing up to launch an attack that would dwarf both Bloody Sunday and the Custom House. 
Now, this was called off at the very last minute. This was a huge hit that was scheduled to target scores, if not hundreds of auxiliaries, in one swoop that had to be called off 15 minutes before zero hour. The fact that this was called off successfully and without mishap is a testament to IRA organisation in the city. You have the Dublin Guard going full tilt right up to the truce. You have, a similar, similarly throughout the country, you have killings going on right up until noon on the 11th of July. The last shots being fired at 5 to 12. Then you have the truce itself. Now, this really must have been something to behold. The celebrations that took place in Dublin are described vividly in the book and could probably best be summarised as by a, a pent-up tsunami of joy and relief being unleashed on the capital streets at once. Car horns, tram chimes, ship bells and whistles, church bells all sounding off at noon, people surging to the streets, to the bars and cafes, to the beaches. You have huge celebrations among Republican prisoners. You have poignant reflections from some of them of the sacrifices and the events that had led to this juncture. You had auxiliaries sharing train carriages to the city's beaches with IRA members now unafraid of one another. You had people gathered in churches to pray. You had lots of others who simply went on the raz. <laughs> I mean, you can imagine people had been living with the constant fear of arrest of being maimed or killed or their loved ones falling to shrapnel or bullet, then suddenly it's all over. You also had immense pride, and this is reflected in the thousands of tricolour flags flown from buildings throughout the city at what had been achieved. There really was a groundswell of pride. People had witnessed chronic shortages, unemployment and destitution for so many and for so long, but now you had hope that this had all been for something and that having got to this point, the only way really was up. So in a nutshell, you really had unbridled joy and relief. Now, there's a really brilliant photo towards the end of the book of a small child carrying a tricolour flag on the day of the truce. There's a, a man and a woman are looking on and-, and Yeah, I'll stick it up to the it's, it's, a, it's a brilliant photograph. And I'm surprised that nobody picked up on it before. Yeah, okay. Now, as you can see, it's really grainy, but you can still make out the smiles on their faces and perhaps the relief. Now, this was probably the first time in a long time that this kid and so many others could be let run free by its parents without fear of bullet or bomb fragments. And, and what a day to do it. But what also struck me was that this child is probably about the same age as the Republic, probably born at roughly the same time as the doll first sat in January 1919. And as we mentioned in the book, both were similarly youthful. Uh, similarly blooming and similarly joyous on that day. But we also say that both were similarly vulnerable. Inevitably, with youth goes vulnerability. Vulnerability to one's own lack of experience in the world. And this was certainly the case for the Republic, whose flag the child is carrying. For the Republic ultimately proved vulnerable to the harsh and unforgiving world of real politics. But still, it's, it's a wonderful and a joyous picture, and, and it's nice just to see it, I think, for what it is. A window, after all, into a day that was won against such overwhelming odds, and that was fought ultimately since 1916. And look, according to the proclamation read out in 1916, fought precisely on behalf of not just that particular child, but on behalf of all children in Ireland then and since. Okay. I have one last question before I throw it open to the audience. It's a controversial question, but I'd like your opinion on it. Um, right, so the government of Northern Ireland opens up in May, um, or it officially gets opened up in, in June, but you know, like it's established in May. Um, and then like the truce doesn't come along until July. Is that right? So were they already short-footed, the Irish? Could it be argued that either side actually won the War of Independence? Did the Irish even win the War of Independence? Um, Darren, do you want to take this one or will I? Um, I, I would say, yeah. I'd say they did. I think Derek was right there. He said before politics got involved in it. I think, you know, there would have been underhand stuff going on. I think De Valera said it, there's more in the tank. Why have we agreed? Um, you've, got to, you've got to sort of think about it. Like um, Derek hit quite a lot on that there. So I'll 
try not to repeat what he says. Um, the IRA were gearing up for more attacks, like the Grafton Street thing was something else. Um, they basically fought the British to a, to a standstill. They were there was not a lot more they could do apart from flood the country. And that was going to cost them a fortune. They'd just come out of the First World War. They were broke. Like, um, everyone wanted their empire. The, the trade, America was looking to get into the uh, the trading routes in India and stuff like that. And so I, I think Dick McKee said it himself. He goes, you know, to, to get Britain to the, to the negotiation table, you have to beat them in the field. So obviously they bet them in the field. There was nothing more they could do. It's like Derek said, they would have flooded the country. They would have had to um, um, basically and remain in the country. What was it? Did, who was it? Did he say to the, um, what was his name? Lloyd George said to De Valera, I'll put a million men in the country. And De Valera said to him, you'll have to feed them. Yeah. It wasn't, it was that, that it was them two that said it, yeah. So there you go. How, how much does it cost to feed a million men and clothes a million men, a million soldiers? And then, you know, you've got to transport them back when they're on leave. You've got to get them back again. You've got to find places for them to stay. It all costs money. There's no, there's no way could Britain afford to do that. So I think, yes, they did. Um, they were in a good position. They they beaten them. Personally, that's what I think. Yeah, I mean, there's an interesting piece um, t- towards the end of the book where um, at the negotiations when Andy Cope actually says, just picking up what you said there, Darren, in terms of the numbers, Andy Cope actually suggested that that they'd have to send 400,000 troops in and that they just were not prepared to do that because of that, just that it would stink in, in, in public opinion would, would, yeah. in the gutter throughout the world. And as you mentioned as well, Darren, there was um, there was the Washington Naval Conference that the British were very, very aware of as well. Uh, they, had, they, were, they were going to remap the, the strategic picture for the world um, later on that year and early the following year, and, and just they were very aware of our, the, the strength of our of opinion towards Ireland in, in the US. But I mean, the way I look at it, and I've kind of written it out in the book's introduction that it's generally regarded, Marcus, that to decide who holds the ground at the end of a battle or a campaign is generally perceived as the victor. So, therefore, as imperfect as Ireland's victory turned out to be, in my and it was nothing other than a victory. Darren mentioned Richard Mulcahy. Well, I mean, Mulcahy said during the treaty debates later on that the IRA had never actually succeeded in anything more than driving the enemy out of a small-sized barracks. But look, I mean, Mulcahy was, was playing to the gallery here, as were most, if not all, of the debates contributors at that point. But that's not to take away from what he said. If Mulcahy was one thing. He was, also, he was a realist. But nevertheless, the IRA pursued a campaign that was mimicked afterwards throughout the world, uh, most notably, in my opinion, by the communist forces in the Vietnam War. They employed a strategy of simply refusing to lose and of looking down over time the enemy's will to fight. And it worked spectacularly, as said earlier in the IRA's case, by, by employing their intertwined array of forces, their military, their political, and their propaganda with devastating effects. So on the balance of things, we would argue that the Republicans won the war. Yeah, no, it was a great. I, I think uh, you've handled those questions very well. Um, the reason I did ask that as well was because um, I'd read Churchill had said in, in June 22, I think that, you know, that Britain was getting an odious reputation. Um, it's poisoned their relations with America at the time as well. Um, I just, I'll throw this over to the audience. Um, Tony McDonald, hi, third of the way through your latest book, as good as the last, and that was great. Have your plans for another? Definitely, they're on the way, I think. So I think we've addressed that one. Um, but let's see. The Mel uh, has said the active service unit were largely involved in daytime operations where brigade companies took action largely at night. How key were active service union in intelligence gathering? Yeah. I'll answer yes. They would. They had to be because they had to report in. It's very similar to what I said earlier. They had to report in every morning, and they were literally given uh, like a list. Right, this is these will be coming here. These will be coming there, and then they. So they had to have the intelligence, and basically, at the when they were put together, they 
had to go and work out the best points in their areas for uh, attacks. And they had to learn. So another form, they had to learn, every single member had to learn the whole layout of the area, know where they were escaping, know where the threats would come from in the things. So the intelligence they would receive would come from uh, the Dublin Brigade. They would probably still get some at this point from GHQ. They'll find something out. I'll pass that over to them. So there was definitely in, uh, intelligence officers. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, I know of one. I think I think it might be could be James Harper. Maybe was an intelligence officer in there. He used to pick up intelligence. I could be wrong on the name, um, but they definitely had to have their own sort of their own source of intelligence because. There, you know, they'll have people out looking, and next thing they'll see a tender going down. I'm just going to pick Bachelor's Walk because it's the first one that pops into my head from that attack. They'll know it goes down there every day, every day, very similar time. That'll be passed on to them. Someone will pass that information over. They'll look at it and go, there we go. That's one to attack. Okay. So, yeah, um, it's definitely the daytime attacks where definitely to drive things forward there like there was they reckon there was a, coming up to about 10 attacks a day in dublin okay every day like uh luann martin has said she can't wait to get her copy and uh, many congratulations on the latest book liam shorthall has asked i hadn't heard of the concept of members of the active service unit being paid before where did that money come from is that where some of the money collected in the united states went oh uh you would have had, a, a, you know, there, there would have been funds di diverted to, towards various aspects of, of, of the IRA. Um, you know, we, we don't delve into the sort of, you know, the, the you know, how, how the, the budget was micromanaged in that, in that sort of a sense, other than to suggest that there would have been a sort of a central pool. There was, you know, the, the Dáil had to operate, you know, with, with budgets for various departments. It actually it worked as a very effective counter state. That's one of the astonishing aspects of the revolution was how well they did that so funds would have been diverted um brewer was the, was the minister for defense funds would have been diverted towards him that would have went down through ghq the army council etc and on. it would it would have been would have been um dealt out from there yeah because what you've got to remember is when you take in the um the flying columns in the country they were basically men on the run or wanted and had to not not all of them some of them joined you know but that so they would have been on the run. So they would they would get funds like for guns and stuff like that from their own area. Whereas Dublin now they when you're in Dublin, it's a sort of a different and this would probably be the same for Cork, because Cork had an active service unit as well at one point. Um you would you would have they these guys have had to leave their jobs. So they need to have an income. To, to sustain them and you know and for their for their needs so um yeah it would have come down through as derek said there and hit the dublin brigade so they, they would have been paid by the dublin brigade whereas the squad i think was paid by ghq okay. direct i think i i'm not sure on the squad i know it's the derek you said it was the same and we do actually, you know, I don't jog in my memory because we do actually say it's in the book there somewhere about where the active service units funds come from. I just can't remember at the minute, but but there, there or thereabouts anyway. Okay. Okay. Uh, Stephen Doyle has asked, uh, what were your sources for the books apart from the Bureau of Ministry History witness statements? Did you find any new information in your research? Oh Jesus, we found loads of information, and I mean, there's there's too many sources. You know, there's there's the Bureau of Military History. There's there's, there's pension funds. Pension funds. I mean, uh, there's, they're all listed there, you know, in, in in the back of the book. There's just, I mean, there's hundreds, you know, it's it's, it's just too many. There's just so much, so many information strands, whether they're from university publications, from previously, you know, um, well regarded works. Every, I mean, but but one thing that I will say, uh, we're meticulous about cross referencing sources. Yeah particularly when we come across new and potentially controversial information because you have to be okay is, is that is that did you say that was Stephen Dial? yes is that steve with me or Dial? oh Stephen. hey yeah um, well you know us you know as well enough i'm surprised you're asking that question no um when in our previous books we listed basically every um 
witness statement and pension statement we sort of read. And um, we actually realised it would have been bigger than the book itself. Yeah. So we had to and then add in all the books we've hit as well. And, and like Derek was going mad. I thought he was going to go back to college reading all these PhDs and all this sort of thing. So um, we... We sort of decided, okay, we will put them as the primary source, as you'll see it in there. But they're just the the like the, the sites or whatever. I, I'll have a look now if I can see it. Yeah, archives was the military archives, and then the service pension. It would have been it, the book would have been double the size of it, and it, it, so we just decided, right, okay, I'll, and also to be honest, it was going to take a lot of work at the end to start typing them out and get getting them all, making sure they were the right one. That's it, it's like four hundred witness statements, and it's probably similar in actually it was more than four hundred, and something very similar in. Um, in pension statements. And I don't know if anyone has ever gone into the pension statements. You can go through like 80 to 90 pages and find absolutely no information whatsoever. And you can go into one that'll only have four pages and, and it'll just feed you with information. It depends on what the person who was applying for his pension decided he wanted to put down or if they decided to ask them questions. So it, it was, the research was definitely there as, as normal. Okay. Uh, Neil Collins Powell, who was in the film with you, Derek, uh, has said, uh, Sean Collins Powell, Collins' nephew, and a military man claimed that Collins's interference in the customs house was to limit the exposure of the active service unit and the squad, as he was concerned that a grand gesture such as this would pose them to the would expose them to the extent that it would make them ineffective in, in the future. Well, well yo, you go. Do you want me to go first on that or you I'll, go? I'll, I'll, I'll hop in for first here, Darren, but but I mean the fact that there wasn't any outer ring of cover for the operation was what actually facilitated the arrival of the auxiliaries and that's what led to the squad and the active service unit being captured in such large numbers. Yeah, um, the active service unit uh, were under the Dublin Brigade. So Collins really would not have a lot of input on that. He could probably turn around and say, I've got this. I, you guys can, you know, pass the information over, over on for them to do it. The squad, as we know, by that point, they're not really doing a lot. So, um, and they are Dublin Brigade. He was overruled on it. No, they are going in. No, we actually, yeah. and we do, we, we, we feature that in the book. It's, it's I, I, the manager. The manager yeah, Tom, to Tom him. Ennis well, actually, actually uh, said to Collins, when Collins um, dictated that the, the squad were not to be used for the operation, Tom Ennis actually pulled rank and said, well, yes, they are. And uh, I think then Col Collins um, put another couple of decrees in there that they weren't to be, that they were only to be used in certain ways, but, but that didn't turn out case on the day either but just to get back to the original question um oscar trainer was determined as military logic deter would deter determine it on an operation like that you want you need to put uh covering units throughout the city to stop the enemy from being able to converge on the area and that's that's what they were planning on doing but it, but it was actually collins interference that 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 stopped that from happening and this was ultimately what led to the speedy arrival of the auxiliaries okay and to add, add to that, Oscar Trainer Dan, he decided he he never told them, and he he brought out uh, units of the force because first and fourth, didn't he? And he kept he them close. He, he had to bring them in so that they looked like they were part of the attacking party. But the thing but is, he, sent them out. he wasn't able to, to put them around the city in, in, in a way that that he would have he wanted. Now the thing is, if you go back to 1918 and the conscription crisis, which is vividly detailed in, in the first of these two books. Um, you'll see what Dick McKee had planned because they, they were anticipating another uprising effectively in, in, in 1918. And McKee had proposed uh, blocks of volunteers being placed throughout the city in strategic positions overlooking enemy barracks that would be used to contain the enemy. That's pretty much what Trainer had in mind and that's pretty much what was overruled. Okay. Um, Paul Reed has said, fantastic as usual, lads. Thanks for your time. Looking forward to reading the new book. Ryan O'Neill has said, excellent presentation. Look forward to reading the book. Uh, Neil just asked another question. Would the British only have to control the newly formed border and customs in order to suffocate the proclaimed republic rather than a full-scale Cromwellian type invasion? 
That's a very good question. That is, would they have to? I don't they, think America has let them away with it. It's it's not that. It's it's. I mean, and you actually you'd, you'd see that in the in the book as well. There's there's a fair bit of stuff in there where we allude to doll meetings, where they're talking about the amount of stuff. Um, I mean, the stuff that was being exported from Ireland to England. Um, Ireland was, yeah, it's a tactic that they could have used, and yeah, it, it wouldn't have reflected very well. Um, but we didn't really come across much source information that suggested that that was part of, of the strategy. The British High Command, they, they were looking at it in, 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 two, in two ways, as I mentioned there during the interview, um, by you know late spring, early summer 19, 1921, it, it was all out or get out. The only way that they were really, really anticipating beating, you know, subduing the IRA and the rebellion was by conquering the country militarily. That, that was it. Or negotiating. Okay, uh, Aoife Hughes has said, the books are fantastic outline in detail and clarity of a pivotal time in Ireland's yeah. history. Introduce the topic to the novice, while also expanding known details and adding new tidbits to people that have been interested um, previously. Definitely a series of books that should be read by everyone that has even a remote interest in Ireland's history. Uh, Neil has asked, uh, by sending cons to the treaty, had the prospect of reforming an effective force diluted, if not undermined, especially in light of the stunning propaganda which had formed international opinion. Um, what is your opinion on the communication between Dublin and beyond in the countryside? And did this affect the support for the treaty? Yes. Can you read that one again, please, Marcus? Yeah, I'll just, I'll just read the last part of it. What is your opinion on the communication between Dublin and beyond in the countryside? And did this affect the support for the treaty? Well, I mean, yeah, it's a great question. I mean, what's very interesting about that one is we, 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 we deal with that in terms of the truce, of the difficulties in communication, of getting the word around. We refer to Tom Barry finding out on the morning of the truce from a newspaper where he, he was manning a roadblock and one of the volunteers came up and said, listen, there's been a truce in Dublin, and he didn't believe him. So she went back down and bought a newspaper and came up with the, the truces in the newspaper. But yeah, they did. They did awful trouble. But look, that's the same in any war. That's why, you know, you never, these guys, you know, um, leaders never meet up and say, right, we'll have a truce starting from now. They always pick a time, you know, because word has to reach outlying units in, in you know, in the chaos and confusion of war. Um, when it came up to the treaty, um, I'm not really aware of any like serious encumbrances to communications that 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 would have been there between Dublin and the country. There was there was quite effective communications. I mean that's that's visible in the fact that they were able to reach De Valera down in um, I think he was down in Clare or Limerick. Um, which I think him and Mulcahy were down there, and they were able to get a hold of him straight away. They were also able to reach Dublin immediately from London. I don't, I'm not I'm not really aware of any um, serious communication difficulties. Okay. Uh, Darren, Derek and Marcus says Anthony Reardon, brilliant as usual, almost finished book number three, looking forward Thanks, to it. Uh, Stephen Doyle again, um, if just one of the four books was to be made into a movie, which one would you choose and why? Uh, Mark can answer this one too. There's actually, um, I'm just going to say one thing, there is actually a documentary being coming out in about a month or two's time with one or two actors and with some of the historians that are featuring here this evening. But it'll be up on YouTube and Easter Rising Stories. But anyway, lads, I'll let you guys answer that. Oh, oh. God, which one? For, to be torn. To, so I can only choose one. Yeah. Ah, oh, that's hard that's work. Good, but could I not could I not combine the the last two <laughs> and make that All one? Right. Because it, it is one one big story. Oh, no, I, oh man, that's such a hard question. Okay. That, that's the worst question I've ever, ever been asked. Stephen Dodd, just wait till I see you. I swear to God. Stephen, I love the fact you tripped up Darren there. Really. Um, um, Derek, do you want to make this one? Yeah, Marcus, I, 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 the one thing that I'd insist on is that you have to be the director, Marcus. <laughs> we'll hassle him. <laughs> I don't like that. <laughs> if there was one of the four, I'd say the second one. Would be the easier in terms of if you wouldn't need as big a budget the first one would bankrupt hollywood there'd be that many explosions and and and, and, whatnot. Yeah. Um, and then what you call it, the third and the fourth if, if they were done um yeah they'd be they'd be pretty difficult to do given the scope that they take uh the second one you could you could actually probably do um as as, as a you know a lower budget film but this has been said to us time and time again since the first book came out 
Um, we've it's been the amount of people that have been saying that this they need to be not just a film but a, a Netflix or a HBO box set. Somebody needs to get this stuff on the screen because it's just utterly ripping. The, yeah, I remember the first time uh, you were taking me around Main Street and I put down the camera for a second and I was like, really? This actually happened and I didn't know about that. Like, yeah. you know, because I mean, it's true. An awful lot of those battles were absolutely incredible and you're told nothing about them. And they were like, yeah. we're doing really, really well as well. Um, anyway, I just fly through the comments here, okay, because we'll be here all night otherwise. Um, Brian O'Neill, I agree with Darren. The Irish won the War of Independence and brought Britain to the table. Britain couldn't afford to throw money and men at the battle. The Irish propaganda was successful. The British newspapers even published the Irish line. The British public would not necessarily have supported an escalation of activity by the army in Ireland. That created a political problem at home for the British government. Tony MacDonald has said, um, Tony MacDonald, history has shown, I think, that there were no retaliations on Oxys, Black and Tans, or military after the truce, or were there? Oh, well, um, you know, there were incidents. There were. Yeah. There, you know, um, I don't have any at hand, but there were. Yeah, okay. Um, Liam Shorthill, yeah. Gurum, got Derek Argus, Darren, um, Des, um, great stuff, lads. Looking forward to getting my hands on the copy to complete the set of four so far. Uh, Mella said Harry Colley distributed funds in Dublin Brigade and was nearly caught with the cash a number of times. Johnny Doyle, how much does British SOE in World War II owe to the War of Independence IRA? Oh, oh Johnny, uh, typically would have would have would have phenomenal. <laughs> is that Johnny Doyle? Is that? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good man, oh, Johnny. Wow. You love it, love it. <laughs> Stay in there, mate. Right? All right. Would you go with that one, Darren, or do you want me to? What was it? What was the question? I just heard it was Johnny okay. Dollar. Hang on, hang on a minute. Yeah, good, we're talking about setting Europe ablaze. <laughs> How much is British SOE and World War II owe to the War of Independence IRA? Can you explain what SOE is as well? Special <laughs> Operations Executive. Right. Uh, right, okay. Uh, British intelligence, right, has always been very good even the first world war but they went down after the first world war so i i think maybe yeah because johnny will probably kill me if i answer this wrong um i would say yeah because it's probably made them realize don't they've got an empire don't deplete the intelligence you need it so i think when it came down to the second world war they were already probably up and running and there's that spy school in Hounslow and stuff like that. I think my, I, I couldn't be I, I, I couldn't be a hundred percent honest with you with, with, with what went on between uh, after like let's say uh, twenty one to the start of the um, that then when they've started to realise that there's a war coming again. Um, but I can only imagine their their um, their agents were trained. They've realised that, that the agents need to be trained to a very, very high level. Okay. Does that um, work, Danny? <laughs> one, one thing I'd say there, and, and you, I, Marcus. I mean, I, I mentioned it again. It's, it's, or we mentioned it again in the in the introduction um, to this one was what preceded SOE, um, when, when the British were expecting the Germans to invade in nineteen forty. Churchill was, was playing around with the idea of setting up an auxiliary force that would act as a resistance um, if the Germans conquered Britain. Now, I, I would, I would um, strongly suspect that an awful lot of the tactics that they would have been, the sabotage, um, the assassinations and whatnot, I mean, you'd, you'd clearly see plenty of parallels between what they were envisioning and what had gone on in Ireland in the War of Independence. Now, the thing is as well is that a lot of the people who would have been selected for, as this uh, proposed auxiliary force would have been the people who were then possibly transferred into SOE as the war progressed. I wouldn't doubt that they were because they would have been the same type of people, the kind of people who would be perfectly you know, suited to irregular warfare, as they called it. Does that answer your question, Johnny? Eric and Darren have mentioned you regularly actually talking about you in terms of how much you have with the books. Uh, Des, uh, coming the man, used to distribute pay for the ASU. Dear DeFarrell, thanks for all the insight, Derek and Darren. One of the things I really agree with is that you've made this all so accessible and fascinating to read since the first book. It makes me look at Dublin differently, having read the first two books. I wouldn't have read the more academic history books, but this has pulled me in and I could branch out further from here. Looking forward to reading the new book. Um, thanks, Dave. Mel, yeah, Mel has said, excellent evening. 
and other excellent book. Half time and then the next tougher second half. Guru Meal and Maya got Darren, Derek, and well contained Marcus. <laughs> You've no idea. Uh, Christina. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, Christina, absolutely fantastic and brilliant talk. So I look forward to. Hi, sis. Uh, oh, oh, is that the one I've been dropped on, Molly? Is that? Sorry, <laughs> Darren. Yeah. yeah. Good evening. And Johnny Doyle, looking forward to book number four. Thanks for another interesting session. Where can you buy the book before we go? Well, you can get it at all main bookshops. It was due for release uh, this Friday, but it actually came out earlier there last Friday. So, I mean, any, any main bookshops, you can get it. You can get it on all the usual online um, shops as well. You can get it direct from Mercy or Press. If you're from Mercy or Press between now and Friday, you'll be entered into a draw for a signed copy of all four books. Um, you'll also be able to get the, the copies of signed books from ourselves, or particularly me, well, myself here. Um, all you have to do is just PM the page and, and I, I can write a bespoke message to, to yourself or for, for loved ones. Um, pretty much you can get it anywhere. Okay, and uh, Christina has said Book Depository has all four books for free shipping to the USA. Yeah, and that's true. Up on Amazon soon as well, you know, so. And Walmart, don't forget Walmart. We, 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 you know, not right, Darren, we, 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 we knew we were a big thing when we, when, we, when we got into Walmart. Oh yeah, that's right, we were in Walmart, weren't we? <laughs> I remember, I remember that now. All right. Okay. Listen, uh, thanks so much everybody for tuning in. Thanks, Derek and Darren. Congratulations as well. It's fantastic. Well, thanks to you guys. No yeah, problem. thanks. Uh, take care until the next one, right? Until, until the, the next yeah. one, folks. Thanks all. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye. Let's hit the beer. <laughs> <laughs> After now. Oh, God.